It is a great pleasure to introduce our invited speaker, Dr. Fernando uh, Stefani. Fernando was born and raised in Buenos Aires. And after graduating with honors in materials engineering, uh, Fernando obtained the summa cum laude PhD in chemistry in Germany, for which he obtained the Otto Hahn uh, Medal of the Max Planck Society. In 2009, after working uh, with excellent scientists such as Wolfgang Noll, Nick uh, Van Huls, Jochen Feldman, and Stefan Hell, Fernando returned to Buenos Aires to become a professor of experimental physics. He has mentored uh, more than 20 young scientists and established an internationally competitive laboratory that is a regional reference in nanophotonics and super resolution microscopy. So it's a great pleasure to have Fernando with us. Fernando? Hi. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Sí. Okay. Sí. Thank you very much, Leah, for the nice introduction. And thank you to the organizers to having me here today. I'm, I'm really sorry that I cannot be in person. I would have loved to be there in Montevideo with you, but I just had another... Uh, trip planned to Germany at exactly the same date, so I couldn't do it. But anyway, I'm happy that I can do it in this way. And I will try now to share my screen. So the, the topic of my talk today is going to be how to surpass the 10 nanometer resolution limit in fluorescence nanoscopy, or as it also is known, uh, super resolution fluorescence microscopy. So, but before I start, just a few words about where I come from. I uh, come from the Center for Bio Nanoscience Research in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's a rather new research center. And there I have my group, which is a, a small group. Here you see a snapshots from a few years back. And that is here in, that's the current configuration of the group. And, but the work I will be showing to you today was mainly done by Lucia Lopez, uh, you met her already, Luciano Masulo, and Alan Salai. So we, have a, we are lucky to have a strong network of collaborators, both uh, uh, in Argentina and in different parts of the world. And the work I will be showing you today has been done in collaboration with uh, Stefan Hell, Tom Jobin, Damian Refojo from Buenos Aires, Alfredo Cáceres, Nicolás Monsain, and Mariano Bisbal from Córdoba, Guillermo Acuña from the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, and uh, Philip Tinefeld from Munich, and Sabrina Simoncelli here, I almost forget her, from the UC London. Okay, so for instance, microscopy, I don't need to explain to you, right, the benefits of it. It's great, it can vision, it allows us to visualize the distributions of proteins in, in cells, but you know, the, it has this limitation in the resolution due to the diffraction limit of light. And you all know that this has been solved already almost 20 years ago by the methods called super resolution fluorescence microscopy. And here you see some examples like this one on the left of your screen. This is from the lab of uh, Xiao Weizhuang, Harvard they actually discovered this supramolecular structure in neurons applying these techniques. So these are really, this has been really a breakthrough because it allows to visualize things that were impossible to, to see before. Here on the right, you see another example of the same structure. Um, this is from our lab using a different technique, but you see, I put this one to, to show you a comparison between a confocal microscopy image here on the upper right, where you can see that this protein, in this case is a spectrin, it seems to be uniformly distributed in the neurons with a diffraction limited image. But when you perform super resolution imaging, then you realize that, that those proteins are not uniformly distributed, but rather organized in this periodic structure that is called the membrane associated periodic skeleton of neurons. 
And this was uh, so important that the Nobel Committee awarded these three gentlemen with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014. So since then, a family of methods have been developed or of fluorescence nanoscopy, both in, in for scanning microscopes like coordinate target nanoscopy, like STED or resolved, but also for wide field microscopes, the also so-called so coordinate stochastic nanoscopy, like STORM, PALM, or, or DNA paint. And here you see two examples of them. So even though these methods do not face any fundamental limit, so in principle, they could achieve any, any resolution. In fact, in practice, they are limited to a lateral resolution of about 15 to 60 nanometers and to an actual resolution of 30 to 20, 120 nanometers. And this limitation in resolution makes it impossible to visualize molecular details. For, for example, this microtubule, we can see their organization much better, of course, with super resolution, as you can see here. But if we zoom in again, and we'd like to see how, how, what's the molecular structure of these microtubules, we cannot see it clearly with this level of resolution. To do that, we would need an extra push to get into the sub 10 nanometer resolution. In that case, we would be able to, to discern really the molecular structure of these microtubules. And the problem, the reason why we cannot get farther is irreversible photochemistry. So the fluorophores that we use, they, we want them to be excited with light and to emit a fluorescent photon after that. But sometimes they use that extra energy to undergo a irreversible photochemical reaction. And then uh, the experiment is over. Here you see an example of a single molecule trace. They emit fluorescence up to some point and then they photobleach. Uh, so this limited photon budget that we have is the reason for the limitation uh, in resolution of these techniques. So to circumvent this problem, there are obviously two ways. You either get more photons from a molecule or you get more information from the few photons that you have available. And both strategies have been investigated. So to get more photons from molecules, there are many things you can do nowadays. Actually, there have been a lot of developments in this area, like stabilizing buffers, self-healing dyes, or DNA paint. Here you see some reference names on, this, on these areas. <clears throat> the other alternative, like getting more photons, uh, or getting, sorry, getting more information from the few photons you have, it, it requires the development of new uh, microscopy techniques, like mean flux or a single molecule localization with structure, sequential illumination, or state fret and simpler. These are three examples that actually we have been develop, uh, developing in our lab, and that will be the focus of my talk today. So I will briefly tell you about these three methods. I will not have time to go into the much detail about them. I will present the concepts, but I will be happy to, to address any questions you may have uh, later. And here you have some of the reference papers uh, on, on each of these methods. Okay, so let's start first with uh, STED FRET. FRET, I guess I also don't need to spend too much time explaining it to this audience. So, you know, it's a dipole dipole interaction between a donor molecule and an acceptor molecule. It's a short distance interaction that goes with the six power of the uh, separation distance between the molecules. And for that reason, they provide a signal that is proportional or, or that can reveal very close proximity between two molecules. And this has been used in many assays and bioimaging experiments to visualize biomolecular interactions in biological cells. But diffraction-limited threat imaging has uh, of course, the same problem of any diffraction limited image imaging, but in this case, uh, it's, uh, a bit more problematic because we try to see molecular interactions, but we can only obtain an average information over a diffraction volume where, where hundreds or thousands of interacting molecules may be present. So the average signal we get may be actually uh, diluted, may be 
the interactions might be diluted in that average and maybe we cannot detect them. And also, even if we detect some interactions, where exactly those interactions are happening uh, cannot be uh, observed with this with these methods. So that is a strong motivation to get a super result threat imaging method. For example, I will I will show you an example again with this structure that I, I showed you before. So you see this regular structure of spectrum or acting. Uh, it, it the model, the current model for this structure is the, this one that is shown here on the right. So it's supposed to be formed by actin filaments that form these rings, these actin rings. These rings also contain adducin, and adducin then is a, presents a binding site for spectrum tetramers that make this uh, spacing between the actin rings very regular uh, with a separation distance of about 190 nanometers. So if we would like to detect or verify this interaction between actin and adducin, we would need to uh, a much higher, we would need a much higher resolution. Here you see a confocal imaging, as I showed you, there's no way we can, actually it makes it impossible to, to visualize anything of this structure. If we perform STED imaging like here, then the resolution is enough to detect uh, these actin rings. And now we want to apply FRET to obtain further information about a separation of, uh, between molecules of, of about five nanometers. But we would like to know if that interaction is happening inside these rings and not somewhere else, anywhere on a, on a larger volume. That's why this combination becomes uh, very powerful. So to do this, you need basically uh, a two color STET microscope, like the one you see here, and a FRET pair of two dyes that should be suitable for STET. If you have that, actually, this is a very usual configuration now for two color STED, uh, with these two fluorophores, and they are also a good FRET pair, then we can perform this kind of experiments. We first demonstrated it with a DNA origami. So we constructed artificial synthetic nanostructures where we could have two FRET modules separated by 180 nanometers. This more or less the similar, the, the same distance that in these actin rings in the neurons, a sub diffraction distance. And then we have two FRET modules um, here. If we perform a confocal imaging, then of this, uh, of a diluted sample of this um, DNA origami, we would detect just a diffraction limited spots. But if we perform STED, then we will see that behind those spots, there are actually two spots. Maybe here you cannot see them, but here I have. Uh, selected four of them so that you can see them better. You can clearly resolve these two spots in both channels, donor and acceptor, with a resolution of about 40 nanometers in each case. So if we have that, then we can apply a, okay, this is just an observation of single molecule FRET uh, in a super resolved uh, manner. But if we have that, then we can apply a formalism to quantify FRET. And we chose this one developed by Tom Jovin and Elizabeth harris Erichman because it, um, it's a, a robust method for intensity-based FRET. Now we need to do intensity-based state FRET. And that requires a few to take a bit more of care. For example, to computing for uh, photo bleaching, we included in our workflow, uh, like a confocal image before and after steading uh, to compute how much the, the acceptor was being bleached. And then you, I mean, the input parameters are, as usual, three images, like acceptor, acceptor images, donor, donor, and donor acceptor images, like in a normal uh, state, uh, sorry, FRET imaging experiment. And another control that you have to take into account to do this properly is that when you reduce, so when you increase your resolution, you are reducing the averaging, and therefore there could be variations local variations in the concentrations of donor and or acceptor. Therefore, one has to take that into account because otherwise uh, we may compute false uh, positive threat, uh, threat events. But this can be done by using samples labeled only with the donor and only with the acceptor under identical conditions. And we can compute the F values, so 
remember here we compute FRET based on this F value. We are not computing FRET efficiencies, but just this F value that is proportional basically to the uh, transfer rate of uh, energy transfer. And we see that in a, the control sample, we have some values of F that are represented by this histogram here in pink. And in the real sample, we see that there are F values much higher, as you can see here. This is a comparison of a confocal and a state measurement. In the confocal measurement, the separation between control and sample is very clear because of the averaging. But in the state measurement, there are situations in which, for example, there is, a, there is an acceptor, but there is a fewer concentration of donor and that may appear as threat, but, but it is not, or the, other, or the opposite. But nevertheless, it, uh, once these two distributions are measured, then one can apply a threshold of F values and detect threat positive events with a clear statistical significance, like in this case. And that's what we did here, again, on this membrane periodic skeleton of neurons, and now we label adosin and actin, and then we could detect clearly that the interactions were happening with a periodicity of 190 nanometers, as we expected from this uh, uh, structure. And this subdiffraction information about uh, molecular interactions is impossible to detect with a confocal image. Actually, you detect threat positive events, but on some places, and you have no idea how to correlate those to the real structure of the, of the, of the cell, like it's, it is done in this case. Okay, so that's uh, one way to obtain sub 10 nanometer information uh, using a super result FRET measurement. The second way that, we, that I want to show you today to obtain uh, sub 10 nanometer resolution is actually a direct visualization method. Here we will directly localize the position of molecules with a precision much higher than 10 nanometers. This is a method that is, com that is uh, suitable for TIRF microscopes, for, for supercritical illumination, for micro microscopes working under total internal reflection microscopy. So you know that when you illuminate your sample with a total internal reflection, what happens is that you get an evanescent field inside your sample. That means an excitation field that decays exponentially into the sample. This already gives you uh, an effect that can provide you uh, a positioning information in the axial direction because molecules will look brighter the closer they are to the interface. But if you apply this just like this, you cannot get too accurate. You need to take into account one more thing. And that's the, the change in the emission pattern of molecules when they get closer to the interface. What you see here in this plot are the emission patterns, the angular emission patterns of molecules as they get closer to a dielectric interface between water and glass. That's the emission pattern for 200, a separation of 250 nanometers, 150, 50, and five nanometers. There are two sets of data because uh, the behavior is different for a dipole or a molecule oriented perpendicular to the interface or parallel to the interface. But in both cases, the molecules emit more light the closer they are to the interface, and they emit more light into the glass hemispace and therefore into your objective lens. So this is an extra effect, an additional effect that also makes molecules brighter the closer they are to the interface. One can compute that. That's the curve for the vertical dipole. That's the curve for the horizontal dipole. And the red curve is the isotropic average behavior. So taking into account these two effects that make molecules brighter when they are closer to an interface, we obtain a very good calibration of the single molecule signals. So the real, the exact solution is the red curve here and the blue curve is an uh, exponential approximation, which is quite satisfactory. Therefore, we could calibrate our signals based on these three parameters, just basically the signal of a molecule when it's exactly at the, at the interface that we can obtain, like you see here, 
just throwing fluorophores on the glass and measure them. Here's the average uh, single molecule signal when they are at the interface. And these other two parameters, alpha f and, the, and df, can be obtained from calculations. Now with this uh, calibration, we could estimate what the, the localization error in set in the axial direction will be. And we see that we can get well below 10 nanometers for various parameters. So then we applied it in combination with DNA paint. DNA paint, I guess you also know what it is. It's one, one of these single molecule localization microscopy methods. Basically, we record a video of blinking molecules in our sample. And each blinking event looks like this. So it's basically a molecule that starts emitting light for some frames and then it stops. So by detecting these events, we can compute uh, first, we can get the, the in-plane position of the molecule, for example, by fitting a Gaussian to these signals, and we can determine the center, that is where the molecule is in the XY plane. But also now using our calibration that I just showed you, we can take the average intensity for that we discard the first frame and the last frame because maybe the molecule was not on all the time so we take just the uh, the inner frames with that with that we get the number uh, an average number of photons from these frames and from that we obtain the axial position so now we have x y and z coordinates of each molecule so we can obtain super resolved images in 3d on a conventional TIRF microscope and this method is highly precise. You can see here, these are microtubules, like I showed you before, but now we can obtain cross-sections of them and really see and resolve the cross-section of microtubules. But you see, you know, there is a hollow in the center. We can measure the diameter, etc. And eventually this can be start to be applied to address biological questions, like how molecules are organized uh, along microtubules. So this method is compatible with any single molecule localization method like STORM, PALM, DNA Paint, and we provide a, an open source software to apply it in combination with any of these methods. You can get it on this uh, public repository. Well, and finally, one last way of getting into the sub 10 nanometer resolution regime that we called single molecule localization with sequential structured illumination. So a few years back, uh, like five years ago, we published a method called MinFlux, which uh, was uh, really a breakthrough because it provides a tunable nanometer resolution. So MinFlux consists of interrogating the position of a molecule here, like this uh, blue star here. We interrogate its position by exposing it to four, uh, by exposing it to a beam with a zero of intensity in the center, like this, this donut beam shown here in red, in four different positions. So by recording the single molecule fluorescence intensity in these four positions, we could estimate where that molecule is. And the interesting thing about mean flux is that the, the size of this excitation pattern here shown as L, can be reduced almost indefinitely, just limited by the background. So in that case, we obtain a localization precision that is no longer limited by the wavelength of light in any way at all, because we can reduce it uh, as we, in case we need more uh, precision. Of course, the precision is also determined by the number of photons that we detect. Here you see an example with an L of 150 nanometers but it's very photon efficient. You see here with just 50 detected photons, we get a localization precision of about 10 nanometers. And with a few thousand photons, we are already in the one nanometer regime. But if this is not enough, we can reduce L. That's what is shown here in this, in this plot. For example, with a thousand photons and 150 nanometers, that's the blue curve, we are in about two nanometers. But if that's not enough, we can reduce L to 100 or to 50, and then we get even more and more precise. So that's a way of zooming in, zooming in and getting more and more accurate in the way you localize your things. So MinFlux has found to be useful for different applications, like for nano imaging. Here you see an example of a 
another DNA origami with very short distances between fluorophores can be clearly resolved uh, with mean flux. It can be used for super fast tracking. That's advantageous because if you need very few photons to localize a molecule, then you can also track faster because you need uh, a much shorter integration time to, to obtain a position. And it can also be used for super resolved uh, flim measurements, which is actually not easy with other super resolution methods. In terms of instrumentation on, on how to apply this method, the first time we did it using electro optic modulators and electro optic deflectors. So these electro optic uh, devices, so this, this schematic looks very simple, but it's not so simple in practice because these electro optic devices are expensive. You need fast electronics to synchronize them, uh, but we needed them in order to perform these four point measurements sufficiently fast. I mean, faster than the blink of a molecule. In this case, we could do it at eight kilohertz using these devices. Later, we came up with, we came up with this other configuration that it looks more complicated, but in fact, it's easier and more convenient. And this is called a pulsed interleaved min flux. So what we did here is to take a pulsed laser. We split the laser beam in four and to each of these new beams, we introduced a delay of a quarter of a period. And then we recombine those beams again. We apply the phase modulation always no, to obtain the a focus with a central zero of intensity. And now by displacing these four beams in space on the sample plane, we can perform the mean flux measurements at a much faster rate, actually at the repetition rate of the laser. That means we can perform mean flux measurements at 20 or 40 megahertz. And this is uh, now the maximum speed that you can achieve. And it's actually, it provides measurements that are limited just by the count rate of your label tag. Okay, so mean flux, um, was developed in 2017 and provided a very efficient way of localizing molecules, but other methods were also developed uh, for this goal. For example, Minstead last year is a method that uses uh, STED over a STED excitation PSF, so that's a combination of a Gaussian excitation beam and a depletion beam with a uh, central zero, this produces an effective PSF that is subdiffraction. And in this paper, they, they made a circular path around a fluorophore to localize that fluorophore very precisely. But actually this uh, idea using diffraction limited beams uh, is quite old. It's, it was first proposed theoretically by Jörg Enderlein in the year 2000, and then first demonstrated uh, experimentally in the group of Enrico Graton. It was called a then orbital tracking. But there are other methods too, like this for focus particle tracking that you see here. It looks quite similar to the mean flux, but using uh, Gaussian beams instead of these donut beams, or this single molecule confocal tracking that was published two years ago, which is actually just a reinvention of the orbital tracking. There's really nothing new here. So why do I show you this? Because over the years, different groups have been trying to localize fluorophores very precisely, and they have developed methods for that. But these methods were developed independently using different hardware, different data acquisition routines, and different data analysis algorithms. So they seem quite different, uh, but in fact, they can all be described with a common framework. Uh, and that's important not only for understanding better these methods, but also to develop new ones. And I, and I will show you an example now. So the basic idea is you need a, an excitation field for fluorescence that is not uniform. It has to depend on position, this IR. And we will shift that excitation field over a sequence of positions around the fluorophore in any way, like it is shown here schematically. And from recording the, the signal of that single molecule over those positions, we will infer the position of the fluorophore. So basically the goal is 
inferring the position of the emitter, given that we know the intensity profile of our excitation beam, we know the positions where we are placing it, and we register the fluorescent signal of that uh, molecule at each position. So from this input, we can estimate the position of the fluorophore. There are many different ways to estimate that position, but we applied maximum likelihood estimation because it's a widely used method and, and robust method. And now we can compare different methods using the same, uh, this common framework. And that enables a fair comparison between different methods. So for that, we consider, okay, what sequence of positions can we use? So we could use orbital scanning, like you know, positions around a circular path, we could consider a raster scanning, like it is done in any laser scanning microscope, or we could also use the, the min flux configuration, which is just a, let's say, more or less weird way of, of scanning. And in terms of the excitation field, we could use for focused beams, there are basically two, two fundamental options, using an intensity maximum, like in the case of a Gaussian beam, or using an intensity minimum or an intensity zero, like it is done in these um, donut shaped beams. So we will, by combining um, different sequences of the beam and these two options, we could devise a whole bunch of different methods, known methods like orbital tracking or MinSTED, that is basically using a Gaussian excitation field around a circular path, or confocal single molecule localization microscopy, like it is done using a Gaussian over a raster scan, and from that data localize a molecule inside that, that, uh, that raster. Or you can do min flux, which uses a donut beam over these four positions. So these are all methods that have been realized in diff with different uh, data analysis, and we can compare them fairly using our common framework. But not only that, we can also think of new methods. So why not doing orbital tracking with a donut beam? That's also possible. And now we can evaluate if it's benefit beneficial or it has any advantages. Uh, or why not doing a, why not raster scanning a minimum of lights, like in this method we call the RAST beam, and see if that's of any use. We can also compare it. So here you see a, a very small summary of this. You can find more details on this paper. So what you see here is uh, basically the best performance that they, you can achieve with orbital tracking, RASMAX, MinFlux, or these new methods, orbital tracking with a minimum and RASMAX. The first thing you notice is that yeah, all the methods using a minimum of light are providing the best localization position. And another thing you can notice very quickly is that this, the methods using a a Gaussian beam or a maximum of light, they require a larger scan. And there is a reason for that. I will try to show you here in this uh, example using it, let's say the 1D problem, the one dimensional problem. So this is like the one dimensional localization problem using maxima of light or minima of light. The maximum of lights are represented by Gaussians and the minima of light are represented by parabolic uh, minimum. And to compute the, the position information about the, uh, where a molecule is, we compute this basically the probability of the relative probability of exciting a molecule with one of the beams. And that's the blue curve. So what you see here is if you use Gaussian beams, if you put the Gaussian beams far away from or farther apart from each other, you see that the probability uh, behaves nicely. Why? Because it, it it spans the complete range from zero to one in a small, in a given region of space here. If you bring the two maxima closer together, you see that the, the probability becomes less sharp and eventually actually starts uh, spanning less than the full range. So it's, the localization problem is becoming less favorable if we bring the two maxima closer together. So then you might think, okay, let's put them really far apart. And in fact, that works. If you put these two uh, beams very far apart and you use just the tails of the Gaussians, this becomes very sharp. That means you are very sensitive to detect two different positions in the nanometer scale. So that would be good. 
But in practice, you cannot do that because this, in practice, Gaussian beams are not Gaussian in this area, actually. In, in real life, you have secondary maxima appearing here, so the problem doesn't behave well, and this is of no use. On the other hand, if you use minima of light, what happens is kind of the opposite. First, the probability uh, as a function of the position becomes sharper and sharper as you bring the two minima closer together. And it always span, spans the full range from one to zero between the two zeros of your beam. That always happens. And also, in fact, near the zeros, if you consider the parabolic approximation, the problem is scale invariant. So basically, this is, this is how it behaves from L over two to L over two, where, where L is the total distance between the two zeros. And this is always the same. It doesn't matter what the value of L is. And that is the key of these methods based on exciting with a zero of intensity. You can zoom in as much as you want because the problem is scale invariant. And it becomes actually, so you become more and more precise in absolute terms as you make uh, the two zeros closer together. So from all the methods using minima, we found this one very interesting because, okay, mean flux has been already been shown. It's experimentally quite complicated. We have simplified it with the pulse interleaf mean flux, but still using a regular square raster, like it's done in any scanning microscope is, is easier. So, and it provides exactly the same kind of performance. So why not trying it? So that's what we did. And to do that, you need basically a, a confocal microscope or, or a laser scanning or any scanning microscope, like you see here. You can scan the beam or you can scan the sample. In this case, it's a laser scanner microscope. And then you need only two modifications. You need first a phase modulation in your excitation beam in order to get your focus with a zero of intensity at the center. And that's very easy. And then you need a drift correction. This is actually common to all methods that aim to achieve nanometer resolution or nanometer localization precision. All the microscopes have a you know, thermomechanical drift of, of about tens of nanometers per minute. And you need to correct that if you really want to achieve the, this level of resolution. But this can be done in various ways. And we have published also uh, ways to do it in our papers that are quite effective. So with these two simple modifications, you now can perform a rust beam. This is an example of single molecules. If you make an image, like a larger scan, you will see the single molecules look like this. And now if you want to localize them very precisely, all you have to do is to make a scan over a very small area near the center, a sub-diffraction scan. Then it looks like this. This is a scan of 100 nanometers with about 200 photons, but you can collect more photons or more photons. And it, the, the position of the molecule, in this case, visualized as a zero of intensity or a minimum of intensity becomes more and more evident. If we uh, compute the localization precision, you see here, that's the experimental data. This is, goes between one and three nanometers, as you can see, as a function of the number of photons that we used. And the red line, is the theoretically maximum localization precision expressed as the kramer rao lower bound. And the gray shade here uh, is the expected localization precision taking into account the theoretical limit plus the experimental correction for our drift. And we see that the data uh, follows that trend quite nicely. So we are in the one to two nanometer regime with a few thousand photons. And Next, we made an experiment of imaging. So we again used one of our origamis with, in this case, with six fluorophores. Now, if you image the origamis with a, a large scan, they will look again, almost like single molecules. There's no way to tell here how many molecules are behind that. But now we start doing a, a sub-diffraction scan uh, over one of them. And these molecules are uh, prepared to be blinking. So we see the blinking and now we can, uh, remain there for some minutes, as you can see here. And as the molecules shine up, they turn on, we can see uh, the, the expected signal and determine its position. So from each blinking event, we obtain a position. 
And then we can make a histogram of positions and obtain this uh, rendered image where we can, again, we can, we can retrieve the, the organization of the molecules with about two nanometers resolution. So Rathmin is, uh, in conclusion, very uh, powerful. It provides the same kind of resolution of, of MinFlux, but it can be applied on any laser scanning or sample scanning on focal microscope with very few modifications. Instead of uh, doing it with MinFlux, that is in instrumentally very complicated or costly. Commercial versions of MinFlux are between one and two million euros. So we believe this will make much easier the implementation of sub 10 nanometer resolution in many laboratories around the world. So to finalize a, a few thoughts about this kind of methods, I believe that the future for these methods will be uh, fast and accurate tracking. Uh, and for that, pulse mean flux is the, the method of choice because it provides the faster uh, measurement rate, can go up to megahertz, and for nano imaging, I believe that the Rastmin is a, uh, the method of choice for the future uh, in this type of measurements. But I have to say that a few years back, achieving one or two nanometer resolution was really some, something unique. But this capacity is, is losing significance lately because day by day, there are more tricks to get more photons out of fluorophores. Uh, the stabilization is getting better. And there is also the label size limit. So it's really a challenge to label samples with the target, with tags uh, smaller than a few nanometers. So uh, let's see how important it is to get really one nanometer resolution. Another edge for these methods that I think it will be very interesting to explore in the future is to obtain 10 to 20 nanometer resolution, let's say very nice super resolution imaging, not one nanometer, maybe 20, but using so-called bad fluorophores, you know, uh, super resolution methods require a specific library of fluorophores. And many fluorophores cannot be used because they, they are not photostable enough. So since these methods require much fewer photons to obtain a good resolution, I think we can start using, for example, bad fluorophores or proteins that are not stable enough to obtain super resolved images that before were impossible. So this is a nice, interesting new avenue to explore. And finally, since the, these methods, so like MinFlux or Rastmin, they are based basically on absorption. So they are probing the absorption of the uh, emitter. And camera-based methods are based purely on detection. So now we have two methods that can achieve a few nanometer resolution and one of them is probing absorption and the other one is probing emission. So I think there will be interesting physics experiments to try to visualize energy transfer pathways by identifying where energy, photonic energy is absorbed and where it is emitted. So that's another interesting, in my opinion, avenue for the future. Okay, with that I finish and I thank you all for this invitation and I would like to make an advertisement for any people that would, could be working in Germany to come to our lab with this uh, Feodoro Linen Fersions stipendium that is uh, very convenient um, to make a postdoc stay in my lab. Thank you very much. Gracias, Fernando. We have a room for one or two questions. Fernando, thank you. It was a very impressive talk. Uh, my question is how costly is in terms of money and time and um, um, technical capacity to adapt an old confocal microscope to uh, uh, incorporate Rathmin? Thank you, thank you, very good question. So in terms of um, equipment costs, it, uh, the modifications that you need are below 5,000 US dollars. And in terms of software, we, have, we provide all the software necessary as open source in our repositories. So, and in terms of the designs, I mean, so how to make the modifications, we also are providing to anyone interested the footprints of the, of the necessary modifications and can also actually uh, come to our labs or we can show people through video conferences how to do it. So I think the modifications are, are really at hand 
for many laboratories now. I wanted to ask you about the future or next steps, but you, you already answered that question. <laughs> so could you please to comment on uh, what's your vision in, in bio, the future of bioimaging in not only in Argentina, in, in the region? It would be great. We know okay. that you are involved in in these uh, topics. So, okay, I can give you my, my view, my personal view. Bioimaging is, of course, a very important field from, for the life sciences. And there are a number of techniques being developed around the world. So most of the te these techniques are, are usually the latest technologies are very expensive. Sometimes they, it's not only a question of money, it's also a question of, of know-how, you know, new technologies. Technologies have three components. Technologies are made of hardware, software, and brainware. So the hardware are the machines that you need. The, the software are the protocols, the codes that you need to operate those machines. And the brainware is the, the necessary knowledge, the know-how, of how to use that software and, and hardware. So you need the three components to apply a technology. And hardware, okay, it can be costly, but you can get it. It can be shipped around the world. Software is almost immediately shared electronically nowadays. And the hardest part is the brainware because that's uh, inside our heads and there's no way to make it fast. So you need to train people. And for that, people need to uh, be educated, it has to gain experience, and that takes moving people around. So either inviting experts or sending people to be trained to different places in order to transfer technology properly. So I think our challenge in Latin America is to try to, I would say the bottleneck is the, the brain work. We need to train people because the rest uh, can be obtained eventually. And in and particularly well in, in our lab, and I think other labs are, around the world are working towards this direction and in the sense of trying to make open microscopy to share uh, software, to share designs, blueprints, even list. There's a tendency now to share lists of uh, hardware components to, to, to construct a microscope. So I think there is a, a world tendency to, to share technology. But as I said, the, the hardest part will be to, to get the know-how. And uh, so I think we should put focus on that. Um, and how it is done uh, currently in Latin America? Well, I can talk about Argentina and I think we are, we are lagging behind on this, on this aspect. Um, we, we don't have uh, effective enough programs to, to attract talents from other parts of the world or to send our scientists to be trained and return to Argentina. That's something we definitely have to work on. Thank you, uh, Fernando, for your presentation and, and comments. 